let's use the mathematical tools we have at our disposal now to derive something which is very relevant for physics, namely the Kramers-Kronig dispersion relationships. So let's start our story as usual with a function f of z, which is nicely well-behaved and analytic, and which has the extra property that the limit at infinity of f of z is equal to zero in the upper half plane. So that's an important condition that we'll need later on. And then for fun, let's look at the real axis and let's focus our attention on a point x zero on that axis. And let's have a look at a contour like this, okay, where we have a small circle with radius epsilon. So this is the point x naught plus epsilon. The radius here we have big R. And then of course over here we have x0 minus R and x0 minus epsilon. We've just dreamt up a nice contour and we now want to calculate for fun a, a contour integral of a function f of z divided by z minus x0 dz. So let's just see where this, uh, this takes us. Now we should be able to figure out on site what this is because there's only a single singularity here at x0 and we've excluded that from our contour. Otherwise it's a well-behaved holomorphic function. So this will be equal to zero thanks to Cauchy's uh, theorem. But let's now try and pry the different contributions to our contour apart. So pause the video and see what happens to the contribution at infinity of this big circle over here. And likewise, the contribution if we take the limit of epsilon going towards zero. So pause the video and see what you get for these particular uh, parts of our contour. Let's focus on the big uh, circle first. So for that, we need the big limit theorem, which will tell us that that contribution will vanish if the following limit will vanish. So we'll have the limit at infinity of our integrand, which is f of z divided by z minus x naught, and not forgetting, of course, uh, multiplication by z minus x naught. So this thing cancels. And if we go back to our uh, condition over here, that the limit at infinity of f of z in the upper half plane is equal to zero, that means indeed that this limit will also vanish, and therefore we don't have to worry about the contribution of this part here to the contour in the limit of r going towards infinity. Likewise, for the small circle, we have then the small limit theorem. So we need to look at the limit at x0 of f of z, well, the same story basically here, z minus x0, z minus x0, that will cancel. And then we have f of x0 here. So in this particular case, the contribution to that from that small circle will be equal to j times the angle uh, that's being spanned by this particular circle here or semicircle remember of course in this case that we traverse this thing in the clockwise direction so not the counterclockwise direction which is by definition positive so therefore here the angle is minus pi and then we have the value of our limit which we just calculated to be f of x zero so this is the small limit theorem and that's a contribution from that small circle here Suppose you completely forgot about the small limit theorem, then it turns out that it's pretty easy to recalculate the results, uh, especially in case where we have a single pole, like what we have here, simply by using parameterization. So if you're going to say that on our small circle, z is equal to x naught plus epsilon a to the j theta, then it's not so difficult to also calculate the contribution from that uh, um, integral. What we're basically needing to look at is the limit where epsilon goes to zero of an integral where the angle goes from pi to zero. And again, remember, we start at the left here where the argument is pi and then we move to zero because we traverse in the clockwise direction. And then if we parameterize our integrand, we have here f of x naught 
plus epsilon exponential j theta. We divide that by z minus x naught, so the x naught cancels, giving us epsilon exponential j theta. And then finally taking the derivative dz, that then becomes epsilon j exponential j theta d theta. Good news is that lots of stuff cancels. Okay. And then if we exchange the limits and the integration, and we assume that we can do that, then basically this numerator here just reduces to a constant f of x zero, which we can bring outside of the integration sign. And then we have the integral from pi to zero of d theta. Uh, and I forgot my j here. So also here the end result is j minus pi f of x zero. So for free, what we have here is a quick proof of the small limit theorem in case you're dealing with a single uh, pole. Good, now that that's out of the way, let's take the next step. Let's uh, pause the video and combine all the stuff, the puzzle pieces that you have left and see if you can use that to calculate the value of f at the point x zero. So if we do that, we have, uh, first of all, the limit of epsilon going towards zero. So the contribution from the left part of the uh, real axis. So it's an integral from minus infinity to x naught minus epsilon of our integrand f of x divided by x minus x zero. So we're on the real axis, so we replace z by x. And then we have the contribution from the small circle here, which is minus j by f of x zero, which we just calculated. And then also we have a limit uh, of epsilon going towards zero of then the other parts starting at x naught plus epsilon going towards plus infinity of the same integrand here. Okay, so there we have it. And remember, the total value of our contour integral was zero, thanks to Cauchy's uh, theorem. Right. Now we can combine this first term and this last term here, because what's basically happening, it's the same integrand, and we have a singularity at x zero, but we're approaching that singularity in a symmetric fashion from the left and the right. So we have a single epsilon over here. So this basically tells us um, that this is a principal value that we're looking at. So if we bring that all together, we can write down that f of x0 is equal to 1 over j pi, and then the principal value of the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of f of x divided by x minus x0 dx. And that's a nice, interesting result to, to look at. And if you, if you look at it, it smells very much like Cauchy's formula, right? It's uh, slightly different. Um, but yeah, let's elucidate that correspondence a little bit. Let's say that you have a certain contour and you have a point over here and you want to calculate the contour integral f of z divided by z minus that, uh, that point which is lying outside of the contour here then Cauchy's formula tells us that this is a zero. If, on the other hand, you move that point z naught to be inside the contour, then we know that this thing here will then all of a sudden become equal to 2 pi j times f of z naught. So that's Cauchy's formula. But now what we've been doing so far in, in this particular video is we've looked more or less, so if you squint, you can say that we've looked at the situation where the singularity is lying actually on the contour. And then we've avoided that singularity by taking this little small semicircle here. And then you could say that what we've looked at then reduced to the principal value of the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of f of z divided by z minus z naught dz. And then the, the end result was not zero, not two pi j f zero, but actually halfway in between them, namely pi j f of 
z0. So this situation is halfway in between that situation and that situation, and that's also reflected in the fact that the end result is halfway between that end result and that end result. So a bit of hand-waving, of course, uh, but if you squint a little bit, this is more or less what's, uh, what's going on. Okay, we're almost there. What we finally want to do is take this expression over here and split f up into a real part u and an imaginary part v. So pause the video and see if by splitting this up into real and imaginary parts, you can derive a relationship between the real part of f and an integral of the imaginary part of f and the other way around. Very straightforward here. So what we have is that we had that f of x0 um, is equal to a funny integral, but of course f of x0 is actually u of x0 plus jv of x0. And then the funny integral is 1 over pi j. And then we have the principal value. Let's not forget the principal value, right? Then we have the principal value of the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity of f of z. Splitting that up will becoming that will become u of um, x plus j v of x, and then we divide in the denominator by x minus x naught dx. Okay. So let's identify real part and imaginary part here. So for the real part, that uh, becomes well this j will, will cancel here so the real part will be related to v so we have one over pi principal value of our integral and then we have an integral of v of x x minus x naught dx and then finally over here we have this first term here this first uh, term and then the j will become a minus j if we bring it to the numerator we have minus j and then we have 1 over pi principal value of the same integral, at least the same form. But now we have a u instead of a v. Okay, x minus x naught dx. And now it's basically just a matter of writing this in a slightly different form. Just looking at the real part, we can conclude that u of x null, uh, x0 can be written as 1 over pi principal value of the integral minus infinity to plus infinity of v x x minus x zero dx and then something similar for the imaginary part v of x zero is minus one over pi principal value of an integral over u x x minus x naught dx so this is very interesting, and these are the so-called Kramers-Kronig dispersion relationships. And if you look behind the formulas, what they basically tell us is that if you have a function which satisfies the conditions, namely that they vanish at, uh, in the upper half plane at infinity, that you can calculate the value of the real part of that function at a certain point by taking an integral over the imaginary part. And likewise, you can figure out the imaginary part at x0 by taking an integral that only involves knowledge about the real part. So the kramers kronig relationships tell us that there's an intimate relationship between the real part and the imaginary part. They're not completely separate. They depend on each other through these, uh, these formulas. A different way of describing these formulas is saying that the, the pair of functions u and v here, because you can go back and forth between u and v through these integral transforms, is that u and v are the so-called Hilbert transforms of each other. But that's just terminology, it's just another way of saying what is behind these particular equations.